Hey, uh, good morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. This is Bill Gross, and this is our Probate Mastery Weekly Call for Probate Mastery alumni and people looking to get started. We do this every Tuesday at noon Pacific time, where I'm located, 3 p.m. Eastern time, and everything else you can adjust on your own. And we get together, and the primary focus generally is answering questions of those people who are in the probate program on how to launch, how to participate, Really, it's meant to supplement the training with some real world s support coaching along the way to help you turn the theoretical in the pra practical, or another way to think about it is how to transfer your energy and information and your work into money. Remembering though, that the money we receive is reflection of the value we create for other people. So if we're not getting enough money, we need to look and say, what are we not doing in creating enough value for our prospects, for our customers? And so we're here to, to, to talk about that every week. I'm Bill Gross. I'm one of Chad's, you know, students, one of his new star students. I started with Chad's coaching three and a half years ago and launched from scratch a personal production business. I'd been in real estate, knew how to sell houses. I'd been in management and gave up my production, went back into it three and a half years ago from scratch and used probate as my sole lead generation. And as a result, I built a fantastic business, which has paid me a lot of money the last couple of years, created some residual and some equity. And I'm glad to share kind of my process and sequence of other people to help us all be more successful. Some of you have seen all along that path, Joanne and Winston, I think we've been along the way together for the last two, three years. Some of you are new here and either way, we're glad to have you. I know Polly said she's new, glad to have you guys. It's meant to be participative. And what I'll t tell you is that in life, the more you participate, the more you get, uh, the more you participate, the more money you make. So turn on the cameras, let's see your smiling faces. Ask questions and rest assured, if you have a question, if you have a question, probably five or 10 other people do as well. So don't be shy and we're here to, to work together to help everybody be more successful. So that's it, let me open the floor. Who's got something they wanna, a question, challenge, problem, or something you'd like to share with us? I ran into something very interesting, Bill, yesterday. One of my, I sent a card out to, to a, a widow of a military associate who I used to work with at, 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 at the base. The husband passed away from COVID about three, three and a half months ago. And they live in San, they, they lived in San Bernardino County. The house was in his name only. The mortgage was in his name only. And they had been married for almost 40 years. And so he had never switched it over to a living trust. He inherited the property from his mom because I went on RPR and I could see the name of the mom and it was in a living trust, but it transferred to him who is the decedent, the son. So, so, so the wife called me yesterday and we were on the phone 45 minutes and I realized that, that, you know, she, she says, I'm not ready to let him go. So I sat there for 45 minutes, just listen, because I find out that a lot of times that's all that you can do. I did refer her to Paul Horn. I think she's in denial. She she's working with with a family attorney. But when I told her, I said probate is a is a very specialized field. And if she and 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 if he didn't set up anything, he didn't even have a will. And so the house is in shambles. It needs to be remodeled. It probably needs a roof and everything. And I was trying to figure out how to tell her that okay, not all attorneys understand probate and what you're going through. And so she said, well, he's going to try to get the house in my name. I said, really? <laughs> so, so I don't know how else I can, you know, proceed. I guess I, I will be talking to her, you know, throughout, you know, the, the, the period, but, but this is, this is a very touchy subject. I mean, it really is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, number one, the more you listen, the great kindness you can do for somebody who's lost somebody is just to listen and wherever they're at. And you know, unfortunately I've lost my parents and my wife's parents. So I've been through that, you know, and then friends as well, but obviously close family. And I can just say that I've gone kind to of classes on mourning and how to deal with it. And the number one thing you can do really is listen and then be where they're at. So when they're ready to talk business, talk business. When they're not ready to talk business, don't talk business. As far as, you know, I would never want to let somebody deal with their family attorney for probate. 95% of cases done in LA County, I know you're in San Bernardino, but just as an example, I've run the data elsewhere, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but we're having the data, 95% of the cases in LA County 
or followed by trainers who've done one or less probate in the last 12 months. Mm -hmm. So they're really learning because the rules change all the time. They're learning on that case, which makes no sense. The truth is, if there's no other marriages, which sounds like not, so a husband mm -hmm. had the property before he's married, gets married, then transfer the property, has no other kids, has no other ex-wives around, she's going to end up getting it unless there's some will or some the trust that pops up, doesn't sound like that's happening. It's a very simple probate, but the paper has to be done properly to get it done efficiently. And so what I try to do, I appreciate you referred it to Paul. And I think Paul's a great attorney. You know, Paul's like a, is a retail price attorney. It's going to cost, you know, a, a fair amount of money. And, and, I, and I like Paul a lot. I would say that, you know, I, I want to help other people's business to the extent that they help me. But beyond that, I would say that I want to be the solution, not refer to somebody as a solution. And so, what, so once I decide who the right answer is, I say, because well, let me help you with this. And let me make that connection and move the next level. So I, that's why I often do easy hyphen probate as a source or with an attorney, I would get involved and do a three-way call and introduce them. In the old days, I'd take them in my car and drive to the office. Can't really do that now due to COVID and don't need to today. So, but I think you're on the right track. I just, that's kind of how I handle it. Sounds like somewhere how you did. But you know something, the plot, the plot kind of thickens because her husband was taking care of his brother who was, I guess, mentally challenged. And so she told me that he has the mentality of 11 and 12 year old. So he was the guardian. He had guardianship, full guardianship of, of his brother and was caring for him. So, so it's, it's, I was sitting there and I was listening. It, 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 it almost sounded like a soap opera because the family members weren't, weren't helping her with anything and she was completely distraught. So I'll just continue to, to, to call and just talk with her and just listen. That's the only thing I can do right now is just listen because she's, she's so distraught. So, and I told her, it's just so important to get a living trust, have a living trust. And yeah, but that's, but that's, but that's close the, the barn doors now after the cows kind of, yeah. you know, to focus yeah. on what's in front of her. I'll share the tool I have. I Anybody here besides me that play competitive chess? This is called a chess clock. Yes. I mean, I don't play competitive chess, but I've seen the clock. So the way it works I, is each, each member gets a certain amount of time. And so when I'm playing and it's my move, the clock is running on me. When I'm done, I, I, with my move, I hit the button and it goes on to the other person's clock and there's where it's down. So a game can be anywhere from, you know, two minutes to 30 minutes, depending on how you make the game. But mm -hmm. the point is you either win by by checkmating the opponent or if their time runs out. But the way I like this is, I like to think about this as a metaphor for sales. We want the, them talking more than us. And so you want to think about in every conversation, because, because at the end of the day, the more they talk, the smarter they think you are, particularly when we talk about emotional things. So you really want to do your best to get them talking and be where they are and help them understand. We never want to tell people, we want to help them discover, we want to help them understand. So it sounds like you're on the right track and it's going to be take more time than you plan. One thing about business is it always takes longer than we expect. That's just the business. Work. Well, it's very interesting because, because she, she, she knew where I was, but I sent her, I sent her a note card and I had my real estate license. I mean, my real estate business cards in there. She says to, you know, to be honest, I opened up the, the envelope and I was very upset. Because I saw two real estate cars, because everybody's been calling me and you want to sell the house, you want to sell the house. I, she said, I can't sell the house right now. So, so she was just very frustrated. So, so that. Okay. Well, Jordan, as always, thanks for sharing. We're glad to chat with you. Bruce Johnson, see your hand up. I'm happy to help you today. Yeah. So one thing that uh, Joanne, you might want to tell the person that you're dealing with, you mentioned that the decedent died from COVID. So. Have them go to the FEMA site and type in COVID-19 funeral costs and see if they can get some reimbursement for the costs in regards to that. So that's something that a lot of people don't know about. So it's something I recently, I told somebody about that. So I think it's something that we should always keep as a little bit of our arsenal, so to speak, right. to help people out because sometimes they just don't know about these things. And if we can bring that to them, it really shows more value that we're bringing to the table. Yeah. Yeah. I've had, yeah. 
Yeah, I passed that on to her because it was two other military uh, people that that were working working with her, and so I was I was texting them, and 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 I did bring that up, and they didn't even know anything about that. So so whatever information I had, I shared with them because because this was very tragic. How much yeah. do they get? What's the typical benefit? About nine thousand dollars. Woo! Yeah, that's not bad. Yeah, my girlfriend just got that. I heard about it and reached out to her. She reached out to FEMA. Nine grand is what she received. Mm -hmm. Boom. I'm glad my tax money is going somewhere. Okay, good. Yeah. Besides other countries. <laughs> Bruce, thanks so much. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to ask you is that um, I actually raised my hand last week, but unfortunately we lost uh, internet in the entire building here. So I, I got cut off. You were talking about, I think there was five categories you were talking about with the attorneys. That would be a uh, general real estate transaction as a closer, probate admin, probate litigator, estate planning. Was there one more on top of that? Okay. Hold on one second. I did a video on that subject. Let me speak. I've got, I've got my notes here. If you want me to look at those, I have, uh, the general, in, the general attorney, a real estate attorney, a probate administrator, attorney, litigation and estate planning. I think I go. just, I think I just didn't write down real estate attorney separately. So, so maybe, and maybe the reason why you might not have is you and I being in California with, I'm sorry, no, you're not in California, relocated Washington and we use escrow. So that's, that's why we might not put that one down, but in many states, they refer to as probate uh, as real estate attorneys and the great sources of business. I did a video on the subject. I'm going to put it in the chat box, the five, the list of five, and then there'll be the YouTube. They did on the subject. I get asked this a lot and, and, and what happens commonly that, you know, hopefully all of you are in the probate mastery Facebook group, which is really active and I think really productive to get questions answered offline and, and, and you know, after hours and such, but people pop in and say, hey, who knows an attorney in, you know, Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Well, you know, you can know attorneys and you also can know attorneys who do a probate, but just like the one that Joel was talking about, that might not be the right answer for the family. And so what I talked about in the video was that there's different types. And even within the probate world, really the best specialize in one of those five. They don't, the best attorneys in my experience don't even do two. The best probate administration attorney does not do probate litigation because they're totally different business and they'll refer, or maybe in their law firm, they have another attorney. I interviewed in Orange County, Shadi Schaefer, who does probate litigation. And then her colleague, Valerie does a probate administration. They don't ever cross over. They refer to each other. I have another attorney, we call my Mina Sirkin, great probate litigator, does not do probate administration, but her husband does. And so it's really important that you really find out what that tree does. If you want a great attorney, now in some smaller markets, there's only a couple attorneys and they tend to generalize more. But certainly in larger markets like Los Angeles, Orange County, San Francisco, New York, you are definitely better off to a specialist in the field that you're dealing with rather than a um, generalist who's going to do everything poorly. There was a question, I, I hope that answered your question, I think. And there's a video I put in the chat box as well that I shot on that subject as well as I listed the five attorneys. And then Joyce asked for the link on the COVID. I put the link there in the chat box as well. well hopefully it will help. All right, how do you raise my hand? So under reactions, you can raise your hand, but Randy, you get special privilege. Randy, well, it's a, thank you. Uh, thank you, Bruce. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, Randy, Randy Milmeister is a probate specialist as well from Las Vegas and actually has a, is part of a, a mastermind group of agents, particularly from the Mike Furrier organization. Let's see. I am great. Thank you, Bill, for uh, letting us come back on. Yeah. Uh, our, we probably have three, four, five of our MFO probate mastermind group on the call with you. We're all just excited to hear what you share and had a couple of questions. Before, just for full disclosure. So this is kind of like a crossover. And if you ever did a, yeah. did a radio program where like there's, there's a nine o'clock show and a 10 o'clock and they cross over, Randy and I have known each other for a little while. And I come from the Mike Fur organization, which is a system of, of prospecting and kind of general real estate. I've, I've moved into focusing on probate. But the fundamentals are the same, basically. It's a raised part of a, prob of a, of a group within the Mike Ferry that focuses on probate. And one of the key skills and key activities is the lead generation part and cold calling for some of you. 
So I invited him to come in here with a group to kind of share in the mastermind. And so Randy, go ahead, some questions or how can we, we, we would they... Yeah, Bill. So, you know, the, the reason I put this mastermind together last fall, winter was because I just felt I was missing something. I, you know, with our background, we know how to phone prospect. We're prospecting PRs, prospecting attorneys. We have the mailing component now, which a Chad and ATL teach and something else Chad has taught or the, all of those guys, Bruce and uh, that group is also say, Hey, if you, if you don't want to do this kind of prospecting, maybe just becoming a resource to the community, creating a YouTube channel, bring on different guests uh, and providing an education for people in life transition. So what I've been working on is, is to do all of that. All, I, I feel they're all important. I guess my first question for you, what of the people you have come across in, in probate real estate agents, how many are doing all three or more? working to reach the families, reach the PRs, reach the attorneys. When I, and when I say all three, I mean phone, prospecting, mailing, and online marketing, whether it's YouTube, Google, Facebook, all that kind of stuff. To my knowledge, and I've interviewed and talked to hundreds, none to one or two or three. I think that the biggest mistake agents make on the, all the leads, which I think a lot of, I use their brochure and use their website, I like their coaching. I think the data is great. They're also data is nationwide. However, I think when you sell a product, it's hard. And I, I, the same criticism I can make with Mike Ferry. I think it's hard to tell your prospect how hard it is to get business. I think if most real estate uh, companies told prospective new agents how hard we have to work to make money, most agents wouldn't start. And so uh, I, that's the criticism I think in general in our industry. And, and I think that some of the, the, most of the probate companies make it sound easier than it is. I don't believe you can, in most markets, you can just mail out and expect business. I don't believe you can, I do know that you can cold call the phone, but like the Mike Ferry cold calling, it's going to be a grind. It's going to be three hours every day, five days a week. And if you're okay with that, then that's what it's going to look like. So most agents either burn out before that or don't are committed to making that kind of time commitment to do that. I did when I started my business and you do, and you're to be commended for that, but very few combine mailing and phone calling and the few that I know that do kill it uh -huh. because that's really what's required. I would, my general feeling is I would never mail anything that I haven't already called and wouldn't call again because you just throwing your money away at that point. But to answer your question, very few do that. And I think if no, no question in my mind, if you took kind of the Mike Ferry approach of calling them all, and I would say recalling them all at least within every 90 days, because now they're those that haven't sold or haven't closed, recalling them every night is like you do expired, you're recycling the data. If you did that combined with mailing, no question you'd be successful all the time. There's no question about it. Just most agents won't stick with that. Terrific. I, I appreciate uh, that feedback. Another question I have is, you know, I know how to now uh, through all this kind of training, set up referral or key referral relationships with attorneys, meaning they're business people like us. I'm looking for a, li a listing. They're looking for estate planning probate, which I believe I've referred about 13 pieces of business to attorneys since the beginning of the year, which is, yeah, it was more than I thought, but I want to keep building on that. Well, well hold uh, stop a second before we go further, cause I, I, I think I know you had it, but I just want to ask this question of everybody first. Everybody on the call who would answer in chat box, he just said, Randy just said, here for a 13 piece of business to turn this. So based on that, how many pieces of business do you think he got back? Do you think he got back less than 13, 13 or more than 13? We'll put in the chat box. If you have a number, put a number. I'm just curious what the answer is. Let's just see what, what the common thoughts are. Okay. I know you're going to answer that. I went, I, I went, I may just dramatize it. Okay. One more than 13. Okay. Okay, go ahead, Randy, continue. Yeah, well, you know, I'll, I'll come back and answer that question. The, the question I was leading to is a little bit separate. There's a separate within probate and trust, there's trust administration companies. They're, they're professional administrators. So I know how to, what to refer to attorneys. I, I know what they're just, I, I don't know what to refer to create this kind of relationship with these administrators because I don't, I, I've been trying, tried to understand what exactly what their business, like how I can help them, but it seems like they're. I, 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 I don't know. Do you, can you just kind of shed a little more light on that or expand on, do you, do you know what I mean when I say trust administrators? So as opposed to a probate trust administrator, you're talking about a trust administrator, right? Correct. So there's, right. so there are companies, so 
in a probate truck administrator, <clears throat> there's a business, and, and I think that kind of in litigation related to that, there's attorneys that do trusts and then they'll administer the trust. Right. But what you're talking about is somebody who is not as personal on the planning, but is more on the assets. So like yeah. Wells Fargo has a trust department. So the local banks. It's more high, I was going to say more high net worth people, also guardianship I, and more like high net worth. I, I, I guess I haven't figured that out yet, how to, what to offer that. So more commonly what happens is the attorney will write a plan and there'll be different, different trustees and uh, successor trustees. And if, if none of them are available, then it goes to one of these professional companies. So they'll say, you know, the trustee will, our successor trustee after me, if I pass will be. Well, Bob, if not Bob, then Mary, if not Mary, then Joe, if not Joe, Bank of America's trust department. And so they end up, you know, in charge of the assets. They tend to be very large, but also the trust that they're involved with, their scope of, of work is more narrow than a general one because the attorneys kind of controlled it. They're just making the arbitrary decisions of what to do. That said, very valuable relationships. The number one probated real estate agent Los Angeles County, I believe. Now, I, I, I can't say I know her this long, but I heard her tell her story and I kind of put some pieces together, was a paralegal. And for a big firm, they handled relationships with one of the biggest trust administrators in Los Angeles. And she wanted to become a real estate agent and, and develop that business, that relationship. So that business is golden if you can get it. It's all about personal relationships. You're not going to cold call and get it. You're not going to mail and get it. You might get an entree. And then you end up having to build a relationship from there that can take a lot of time, you know, golfing or fundraising. And, it, and I think a very common place you're going to find them is at different charity events, because those people tend to market their business for high net worth attorneys and families at charity events. So I have no experience. I know of a couple. I've tried to work on a couple, hard to get in, like any business where there's a lot of money at it, it's going to be very, very competitive. So I, I. I appreciate that. I'm reading one on Thursday through an introduction from another brand, but I just, like I said, I want to go in saying, Hey, this is what I can do for you other than my skill and real estate and managing, you know, property and well, that process. I, I would definitely say that I would go in and ask a lot of questions, right? Mike Fred would say selling is telling, selling is asking questions of kind of what you can do for them. But I also would try to, uh, in particular, again, being a Mike Fred trainee to myself, get off the transaction and get out of the relationship. And I think if I would not ask about any business, try to get lunch with them or whatever else you do, you know, whether you go to the shooting range or you hit golf balls or whatever you might find as an appropriate relationship building activity, make them your friend first. I think if you can get that relationship, then the business will follow. Martha, I saw your hand up and I think I heard you call it. Yes. I am a former probate paralegal and a former trust officer. There you go. And I did a state and trust administration for National City in Ohio. So National City is a very large bank and we had our own real estate department. I can't remember if the department hired outside agents. They may have, but I know we had someone that managed the real estate and they may have taken care of it too. So I would go to the smaller banks and trust companies that do a state and trust administration. And you're looking for somebody that really deceitful that has no relatives around. So we're going to see more and more trust coming on. Attorneys also are trust administrators. And usually Bill's right. They have the paralegals do all the work. And in that case, paralegals would probably be the first contact to find out who sells their real estate. Thank you, Martha. So, I had, so I'll, I'll wrap up with answering the question for how many pieces of business were returned to me. I, I have, I can count. I, I don't have it right in front of me, but I can tell you one attorney, a new cold that I cold called last November, December. I started, I referred a couple of people to him, a couple of my database to him earlier in the year for trust. He referred two probate listings to me, one's closing tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And then his mom needed to sell a house, which I have listed also. Mm -hmm. uh, so I got three from one attorney who I sent two people for trucks. It's probably it, 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 from the beginning of the year, how many have been referred back? Uh, probably six or seven. That's fantastic. Look, you're way better than the average agent. And I knew you're excellent for a while. And so you obviously they figured out your way, better. somehow you distinguish yourself right away and got that. But as you can see from the chat box, 
That's not the common experience. I also think we imagine we give them one and get two or three. That's when we work that way. If we get one for each one, now Randy's only telling us his number year to day. Theoretically, these are relationships that could yield him business this year, next year, the year after, the number could grow. Will it get to 13? My guess is if he stopped referring, he still would, he would end up at 13 or more. But the, but the key thing is these are relationships we have to build. We plant the seed. We, as agents feel like, well, I planted the seed. Why is it not growing? You got to fertilize, you got to weed it, you got to whatever, water it. I, I've never farmed in my life. So you got to build a relationship over time. And that's the nature of relationships. Very long time. Yeah, they do. They're, but they're also about relationships. They, my right. experience with attorneys is they'll all go to lunch. Like one thing, now LA County is a little different and, and Randy, where you were in Vegas, I don't know the COVID you know, world now in LA, you really can't invite somebody to lunch. You're just not, they can ask you, but you really shouldn't ask them is my sense of where we are. But absent that, in my experience, in most, any attorney you ask for lunch will say yes. That's their nature. You go out to lunch, it's a business lunch. You don't ask for business, you're there to develop a relationship. Thank you, Bill. I, that's all the questions I have. I'm sure a couple of my friends will we'll ask some more later. Really appreciate uh, what you're doing here. And I'm Generally, in every area, there's an, uh, a state trust planning group, and sometimes they let not attorneys in. So I've talked to one agent that didn't never got anything, but I think that's more a factor of the agent. But the problem with those, I've been to some of those, and the problem with those, that's in my experience is. There's like way more non-attorneys than attorneys. And I feel like I'm like in the, sh in the shark tank where they throw the feed, the feeding in and it's like a frenzy of people. And then I look like those people and I don't want to look like them. I think we, we want to distinguish ourselves from them. And then you, you're my, again, my experience was I'm talking to an attorney and somebody else would just interrupt as a realtor and hi, I'm from this company. Here's my business card. And it just, you'd be a little careful with some of those networking opportunities that right. you don't want to make yourself look too desperate, right? That's really important that we all, everybody wants to do business with somebody who doesn't need them. It's a classic dating thing, right? Everybody wants to date the girl that doesn't want to date them. That's just how life is. So you make sure that you look that way as well. And you get a, like a resume of all the things you can do for an attorney. Yeah, for sure. I have a brochure. All the leads has a great trifle I use. I keep it in my pocket for those of you. The other thing I'll say, Randy, is greatest movie ever for attorneys. Every attorney loves it, in my experience, is My Cousin Vinny. Every attorney loves that movie. It, it's good on some of the technical stuff. It's funny. But one thing you'll notice is the, the attorney calls the opposing counsel and they go out, in their case, hunting. That's the social thing that's common in this particular area. But the point is, that's their nature. They'll, they'll have a social media and you say, well, how can you have a lunch or a meeting with the other attorney? Don't you hate them? Are you in competition with them? That's just not how they are. They're, they're very social as long as you don't talk about business. The probate bar is very collegial as opposed to litigators. So they do, they know they have to work together. They're dealing with families in tough situation and it's not a dog eat dog usually, although there are some. Martha, where do you do business? Where do you do business? In Pinellas County, Florida. Oh, there were St. Pete. Very nice. Fantastic. And you, you're a real estate agent? Yes. How long have you been in real estate? About 16 years down here. Okay. And about four up in Ohio in the eighties. Any probate focused or where's your business? Well, no, I've talked to a few attorneys, but I haven't really been pursuing it. No, yeah. you should. Yeah. Sounds like you have a, a world of knowledge to build on. Yes, I do. Okay. Anybody who else has, I mean, I could talk to, I could talk to Martha all day long because <laughs> I find that topic fascinating. Or maybe Martha, maybe you and I could talk offline and I can interview you or something. We talk about what you do and. And hopefully get on track on your uh, probate business. Okay. Who else has a question, challenge, problem? Raise your hand, put the chat box. You know, there's the reactions button. You hit your hand up, you want to do that. I'd say wave your arms if you're on the video. If your video's on, but I'm not sure I would see necessarily. Any other questions, challenges, problems? You got a wealth of knowledge here. Who here loves cold calling real quick? A couple of you. Okay. Dean Souza, there's a name. I made you the Mike Ferry thing probably 25 years ago. I don't know if you remember me, but I remember you for sure. No, I do. I remember when you worked uh, for Neil or with Yeah, me. yeah. And been with Mike. I actually started with him right before I got my license, 35 plus years. Wow. 35. So what is that? That's 87. Yeah, it's about time. I actually started with about 87. And I think I was the first person that paid Tom and Matt Ferry to speak in my office as a mortgage business. And my business model was I would 
buy Mike Ferry thousand dollar clubs and then give the coaching products to my real estate agents. That's how I built my mortgage business. Wow. Been around for a while. I see you, Dean. Been a long time. Nice. Dave Pinnell on the call. Welcome, Dave Pinnell. He's closing two deals as we talk, probably. Thing is, I think that a lot of agents try to avoid calling. And I, and I think you really have two choices. You can either call, cold call outbound, or you can warm call outbound, or you can talk to people who call you inbound. But at the end of the day, you're going to end up talking to a lot of people anyway. Slice it if you want to do a lot of business. Now, if you want to do a little bit of business, I don't know. I, I really don't specialize in helping with that. But anybody I know in my career, since 1986, his business, anybody who's made a lot of money talks to a lot of people when we get Yeah. Uh, What's up? I mean, you could just turn the spigot off. You don't want to, in a new business, you just don't call anybody. And uh, if you do, you, it's not, it's, it really doesn't come down to well, how fancy your script can be or how good conversations you can have or convincing someone to sell you a house or buy a house or to list with you, man. They're going to do something. You're going to talk to a hundred people and talk to maybe two people that want to do something. And maybe those two people go into your database or CRM for over a year. I could, I'll sh I could show you an example. I just closed my, the biggest deal of my career. The lady never responded to a letter, never responded to an email. She just opened them in five years. It was a probate we bought, bought back in 2018 and, and we closed it in April. And it was two houses in there. So you could just imagine, and you just never know. I'd send her a random text uh, to my whole database of people that are active status and probate. And she responded, I'm ready. You're the only one that stayed in touch with me and sent me the right information. And it took about two weeks for the appointment. And then it took about 45 days to close them. Really clean deal. I think the general rule is, and, and you know, if you don't agree with this, let me know. If you agree with this, let me know. It's in the chat box. It, it's not about whether it's when, right? That business just takes longer than you would expect it to. Doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Doesn't mean it doesn't work. It means it hasn't worked yet. You may have to continue it. And I think whether you're calling or social media, whatever you're doing, you're building a pipeline of people who are interested and they just take longer than we would think they would take. We tend to make decisions faster because we're salespeople. Joyce is right. post. I just closed one, not probate. But he was the son of a couple that I showed around and I've even forgotten how many years ago it was. If they never bought anything from me, they wound up buying a trailer. And I, we just closed on a house for the son. He's going to try to get his parents and his sister out of trailers into a house. That's why I tell agents all the time. You have to have a database of everybody you've ever met for the rest of your career. And you reach out to them effectively. Call them every 90 days, email them something of value weekly. Connect with them as best you can on social media forever. Uh, it's an asset that just keeps growing and they, they call you back seven years later. I've had, I've had clients call me back seven. Eight. Now I actually was an agent left being an agent, being management for about five years, but I kept my email database going every year and I stepped back into real estate. I had clients who came back to me eight years later from an email. He didn't know I had been out of business. He was just kept getting emails and, and decided to sell property and I, uh, I listed it and sold it for him. Joyce asked, how about postcards and emails for prospecting? And I would say that postcards are great. The challenge there is it's expensive. And it takes multiple points of contact. Most people who track the data will tell you, if we have somebody on their phone call who does postcards, will tell you it's six or seven contacts is, a, is like a minimum campaign. So if it's 50 cents for the card, if you cents for mailing, that's five to six bucks per. And depending on your, you know, return, there's, there's a uh, Dave Pennell. I still have him up there doing, showing us his postcard. So you do postcards. What's your, what's your rate of return on your postcards? What's your ROI? Oh, Hey, I'm sorry. This is what you should mail. It's a invitation letter size. Um, there's nothing fancy to it. I'm putting two stamps on it cause it's far, but I mean, is Arkansas more postage? I don't know. I don't want it coming back to me, so I don't want to measure it either. These are the two people I talked to today. Okay. So that's individual mail, but I think, I think Joyce's question is from a prospecting point of view, uh, when you buy leads from all the leads or you buy them from MTI's probate data or some of these other companies, they'll tell you you should mail out. And I, and I always find it interesting that people telling you mail out for the most part aren't doing that themselves. But when you think about it, you know, if you're going to have to send a campaign of six cards at six bucks per, 
times however many leads you're talking about, if you get 200 a month, that's 1200, but you're going to, the first month do 200, next month, 400, next month, so you're talking about thousands of dollars. You really have to add up. I know when uh, Todd, I'm sorry, when Chad probably mastery, he had a calculator to figure all those things out and actually figure out where I would have to be to make sense. In general, when I look at return on investment, I only count 25% of the commission dollars, not the hundred percent, because I still have to do the work. I still have to list the house. I still have to cover my costs. I also need to make a profit. But that said, uh, whether you, whether you use letters or postcards, you need to trade letters are more expensive than postcards. So I don't know anybody in any metro area that just does mailing successfully make a business. I know there are a couple people who, who've done it in niche markets where there's maybe a little less competition. And I can't speak to that because I live in Los Angeles and I only have marketed major metro areas, but in, in small areas, maybe you can do that. But here in Los Angeles and Orange County and most metro markets, you can mail, but you also have to phone call behind it. Uh, and, and follow up with them for a long time. Hey, Bill, there's a, there's a guy named Alex. You should interview on your podcast. I'll get his last name. He's in LA. He sends a lot of postcards. That's the only way he prospects. Okay. But he's sending, he's sending thousands of though. Is he saying just in Los Angeles? Yeah. I mean, huh. it's really farming. It's farming the pro rate and farming the two or three complexes. Well, that's different. For, I mean, postcards yeah. working at real estate. And, but again, I would say if you're going to work it for a geographic farm to be successful, you probably also are going to increase your odds, also phone call and also door knocking. A condo is great for postcards because you get one listing in the condo and then you have open houses and chances to walk the, the area yeah. uh, and see people in a way that other people don't. For sure, postcards are great for real estate when targeted. I send a lot of postcards to my clients to attorneys that I meet. I mean, I have all different series of postcard campaigns for keeping relationships. That's different than postcards for prospecting, but to mail out cold po uh, postcards or letters, I don't know who's doing that successfully. I've heard here and there stories of it, but I don't think it's a, a game of all. Uh, Jessica, I see your hand up. Let me see if I can figure out how to. I got it. Hey, so I think the Alex guy, David is talking about follows EXP. David, or uh, what's his name? DeGrazia. Okay. And he does like a 10 to 12 point touch campaign with, uh, I think there's four letters and like six or seven different postcards that he mails out. Mm -hmm. And Alex is in that group. If it's who I'm thinking about, he's in LA and he does quite a bit, but he does a, a very diverse amount of work. His stuff is not just in probate, but he does do just mailings and it is extremely expensive and competitive in LA. I think that's his name. Well, I think that's who Dave's talking about, talking about. So there's Alex Sandoval with the EXP, who's a probate specialist. He's in Menlo Park, which is Northern California or Sacramento area. I've never heard of him. I mean, he might be great. I, I'd love to talk, chat with him, but again, he's probably doing more than just probate with mailers like that. It just, I, I do think that once you've talked to them, it makes sense to mail them forever. Once you have, once you get their email, to email them forever, of course. But to just keep sending mail to people who don't ever respond, I don't know that being, what I know about people who do mail is very scientific. They have the numbers down and the responses down. They know what those numbers are. Yeah, Bill, I can tell you, Alex Sandoval is a Mike Berry phone prospecting agent who okay. also does the mailing. Okay. So odds are he's, he's phone it's call in addition to, sure. yeah. I don't know anybody who's just postcarding cold and getting responses, even after five and six cards. I'm sure it happens, but, but I just can't imagine it being a successful business alone. I mean, the faster everybody wraps their brain around that you run this business out of the capital, that's when your business is going to explode anyways. So you've got to keep rolling. If you're going to do all three, social media is going to be the most expensive, prospecting least expensive in the mail. We spend, we spend about 79 cents a letter and we're doing probably $3,000 worth of letters a month. And that's foreclosures, that's burnt houses, that's prorate, that's everything. So we're not just hitting one niche. I do think that, you know, number one that you said hundred percent. The sooner you figure out this is a business and not a job, too many real estate agents and investors, it's like a job for them. They're on a hundred percent commission plan and they never, and they wonder why they don't build any momentum or equity in their business. So you gotta understand this is a business. 
and you invest time to build equity as well as income. And I think the second thing you said, which is also correct, which is that when you can start um, leveraging capital, not just your time. And so you have to choose where to do that. I, I send a lot of mail, but I send all my mail to people I've already met and talked to. I send a lot to attorneys and past clients and um, people I meet because it's, it's my competition can't spend the money that I can spend. So I want to leverage that advantage rather than have to work more hours. I, I don't want to work more hours. I, I work plenty and I like what I do, but I don't want to work more hours. I wouldn't like to work less, if anything. And you could, you could literally hire, uh, sorry, Terry, but you could literally hire everybody to do that for you. The, the only one thing that I, we failed at is you can't replace, you can't replace the closer in you. But if you're not a closer on appointments or closer for appointments, you need to learn some NLP strategies. You need to learn how to some conversation strategy, but you could hire someone. We have someone for 750 a week that does all our letters. She does 50 a day for us. So. Right. You know. Rand, Rand, did you want to answer that question for us? Or did we get it? Jerry asked a question on the people on the call that uh, send direct mail and call. Yeah. So that's exactly what I do. So now uh, we have, I have a system. When I get a list, it's sent to my VA to scrub for real estate. When I get it back, I start calling. My assistant in the office sends out the first letter. 30, 40 days later, we'll send out a postcard. 30, 40 days later, we send out the second letter, which is a different letter you know, from ATL. I, I haven't been able to call as much the last couple of months, but I'll usually, when I'm on schedule and on track, I'll call through a list, depending on how big it is. It's been bigger this last few months, three, four times. So by the time I get through that list and we're sending the second or third mailing, then I've already scrubbed it out. Either they're hundred percent not selling. Somebody's going to stay in the house. They, they've already hired a real estate agent or whatever, for whatever reason, I, I scrub them out. So the list, by the time we mail a second or third time is, is smaller, but my goal is to call as many, and you mentioned it earlier that I need to call because I don't want to keep sending mail to people who are, there's, there's no business there. So it's important for me to call not only to, to create business, but save, save money in the end. And Dean asked if you want to share how many pieces do you mail per month, Randy? So we just got a list. I mean, I just had it scrubbed. We just got a list on Friday. I think it's scrubbed. It was like 200 something. I forgot the number, but just this late, it's 180. So we'll send that first list, that new letter. And then we send the second mailing from the month before. And we send the third mailing from the month before. I also, which I don't do every month. I also send a historical letter about a, a year to 14 months out. So for example, we're going to send out. I believe I just talked to my assistant. We're going to send out, I believe March of, or we're going to send out April of 21. We just got a little bit behind busy also this week. So we'll send out the first letter for this month, the new list, send out the second mailing, which is the postcard. We'll send out the third mailing and then a historical letter. Uh, right. so to track it all, that's an area I need to get, I, I track on my phone prospecting. I need to do better at the mailing because I do want to find out exactly what the ROI is. I can tell you the first year, this is in 2020, when I sent out mailings, I, it was inconsistent and not good because I was trying to figure out the system. I took three listings that year. For some, whatever reason, maybe it's just because I didn't have a system that was inconsistent. 2021, I didn't take any listings. This year for mailing, I believe I've taken two or three. But the mailing, it, it's, it's, it, there's another component to getting a direct piece of business from the mailing. And I'll give you an example. So I have a listing right now, it's active. She called me, Debbie and said, Hey, we got your mail. We'd like to set up a zoom tomorrow because my son's in California. We just can we get on the phone together. We got, we like your letter. We got a bunch of letters and we just, we want to talk to you. I was on the, got on the zoom with her son, Michael without me. I mean, I don't know if I said, I just said, hi. He said, Hey, you know, just so you know, we, we know you're our, our guy because uh, we like your letter. We already went online and, and, you know, did our research. We're just, you know, we, we want you to help us sell the property. So, but the, the letter was almost just an introduction, but it also compelled them to do more research. And I started the last six, seven months to build a, an online asset, not only a website, but a YouTube channel. So by the time they get to me, and this is someone I wasn't able to reach on the phone, they got, it was already a lay down listing. So that's part of my, how do you say, intention of, of building more like that moving in the next quarter or two. So that I have that asset so that I'm still going to, you know, naturally I'm going to do the, we'll call it the grind, the, the daily grind of prospecting. But I also want to have the asset of, well, if I, if I, there's, 
look, I don't want to, it's not necessarily fun every day to come in and do this work, to work hard, it's hard work. So I would like to be able to go on vacation for a month and those, that business continue to come in. I, I, I'm yeah. probably six to 12 months away from that. Yeah. And I think this is where one plus one is three, right? When you postcard, you get a return, your phone call, you get a return. And for those of you Mike Frey guys who are just phone calling, you're going to get business. But if you postcard and mail the same people, delete the mails based on your phone calls, stop calling based on the mailers, the two, one plus one equals three, not two. And if you add to that, maybe an online asset, website, YouTube channel, when people do call you and, and maybe while they're waiting or before you call back, they search you out and figure who you are, they have one plus one plus one equals five or six, because that's going to make your mailing more productive, make your phone call more productive. And so that's where the goal that I find is looking for the synergies of marketing. The other one is we're also marketing the attorney. Then if they asked the attorney, I was thinking about using this guy, Bill Gross, really I see Bill Gross all the time. He interviews attorneys, you know, so that's where the synergy of the marketing starts synergy. to pay off for you. I think in the long run, are you able, Randy, to share what is your historical mailing? What's in it? Yeah. What's the contact with it? it? It's real simple. It's just, and these are all letters from ATL, the historical. Just real quick, all, ATL is all the leads.com. So it's just a service that sells data and market materials in the probate space. Chad used to be the coach for them before he does coaching separately now for probate master. Yeah. So I may have, I, I didn't, I didn't necessarily modify the content, but I made sure that I included now when we're talking about the online assets, say, Hey, for more info, go to my website for more info, go to my probate YouTube channel so that if, if they if we still need help and I haven't, I mean, maybe I got them on the phone nine or 12 months ago and I'll tell you, I actually sold a listing, shoot, I think it closed. Well, this is back in December, a historical, you know, I had talked can't remember now, but I had talked to her at some point, but then nine months later, she got my letter and called me from a historical mailing. So yeah, it's just all these pieces coming together to, to, cause the goal is to make, you know, to do a lot of business, make a lot of money and help a lot of people. I mean, it, it, you know, doing one of these, you can get by, I guess, but that's, I just have, I guess, some different goals and not, not that anyone is right, wrong, good or bad. It's just, there's things I need to, I need to do in, in as well. But yeah, just to answer the question of historical mailing, I met, we, the, the goal is to about 12 months later to mail out, but sometimes, you know, the dates just don't match up. Sometimes like we're going to mail April 21. So that's 14 months ago. And it's not an exact system. Maybe it'll be exact at some point in the future, but we're working that out. Great. I think a lot of stuff, it's just, you know, you're working it out on the fly too. Also people ask me a lot of details about things they do. And. I'm constantly changing and trying to prove it. So Terry Shaw, I see your hand up and you have a question. How can we help you? Thank you. Can you hear me? Yep. I have just recently through the help of some of my associates in my mastermind group come into a listing of the executors of January, February, March, April, and May in Harris County, Texas, over a thousand <clears throat> with names and phone numbers, et cetera, landlines, cell phones. My associate in the group that I started years ago in California, San Francisco, is also working in the market here with me. My question is, and I th I'll tell you what I think is the best approach, but I'd like some input. The order to list, like in this, this case, January list would be, in my opinion, the best list to start with because of the time frame with when the probate process begins and getting closer to the time when they sell the property. Would you have any advice or differences of opinion about that? You know, I, I think I would say the difference between your results on a January list and April list will be insignificant compared to you doing more rather than less. Uh, I mean, if you laid out statistically, of course, I don't know your county. Nobody knows your county uh, at this level statistically. There's advantages to being first. There's advantages to being last. There's advantages to being in the middle. But the biggest advantage is just to contact them. So I would put my energy in, try to figure out how can I reach all of them? Certainly I would focus on those with executives out of, those who are usually richer. Uh, it also means they're out of the property, they're more likely to sell. But other than that difference, I, I would say, put together a plan to contact all of them as quickly as you can through a combination of methods, phone calls, mailers, and social media. Oh, go ahead. Let, I just want to piggyback on, and Bill, you're absolutely right, because if you're waiting to call the January or reach out to the January list now, I've already reached them, touched them, if they answer the mm -hmm. phone eight, nine, 10 times. So they've done blue mailings. I've called them probably half a dozen times. If I had them on the phone, I've already met with them, at, if not in person on Zoom. And so when, when you come in, even though I, I understand the logic of, well, they're not ready to do anything until now, 
I've already, if there's something there, I built the relationship, already taken the, taken the listing. Well, it, I would say, but both, because just like expired listings, I used to call expireds and you, you want to be first on the expireds, but also first is the most competitive piece. You get lost in the noise. A lot of most agents, Randy's an exception. Most will only mail right away. And so the, the genuine ones stop getting any attention. There's advantages to them as well. So I would just say it doesn't really matter. You need a system to market to all of them until they sell the house or until they close out the probate. So I, I would focus on that. What do I need to do to contact all of them? Uh, obviously, if all things are equal, it's four times more business. Why not focus on the system to get you four times more business? Thank you. I'm, I'm using a method of a phone call directly to them. Uh, refers a ringless voicemail as well as text messaging. And I'm still trying to get the metrics on that. It's not working great right now. No, I would not do that. Number one, how, are, are you an investor only or are you a real estate agent? Investor. Investor. I can tell you as a real estate agent, it's almost impossible to use those technologies legally. They're almost, at least my numbers are 9% of the people on the do not call list to begin with. Number one, number two, nobody appreciates that service. The goal of the phone call is not to leave a message. The goal of the phone call is to talk to them. And so certainly if I'm calling somebody, even when we make phone calls as a Mike Ferry trained agent, you know, the best training in cold calling is Mike Ferry's training. And they have the prospecting school. I used to go to that. It's fantastic. In the training, one thing you learn is you only, you hang up after the third ring before the fourth ring, right? Why? Because you want to talk to them. You don't want to leave a message. The message really doesn't have any value. I'd have more people call me back on a missed call than I ever had call me back because of the message I left. I like that. So again, I think there you're trying to avoid contact. If you're not going to do it, find somebody else, maybe find a realtor in your area. We talked about this before, a realtor partner who maybe is trained to make phone calls, let them make the phone calls for you and you pay for the mailing perhaps. But the that value is not the ringless drops. And that stuff to me is all gimmickry. And the people promote it, in my experience, aren't selling houses. And I can tell you as a, a real estate broker, there's no way you can do it legal. I mean, and I'm not shy and I'm not one to, I mean, I, I, I push the law to what I'm allowed to do. I don't think you can do that legally. I just don't believe it. Practically speaking. You also got to remember that these people are 60 plus years old. So you got to think about their perspective at, at this probate. They don't want to be, they want to talk to somebody. They do right. business by trust. Right. So if you're, you're going to try to have the short diet pill to get in front of these people, you're just never going to get there ever. I mean, it's, I think it's like when an attorney refers me to a client, I'll call the client and I'll send a text as a follow-up. I've been referred to them. That's different, but cold. Let me ask you this, Terry. How many times have you gotten a text from somebody that you did business with as a result of an incident? Not often. I me per, me personally never. How many times have you done business with somebody who left you a, a voicemail you didn't talk to? You? No. So I hear you. I don't. I don't think. I'm just I would get as many it. touches in there as possible, and then perhaps you write them. I'm not the most effective, but I I'm better on the phone, and I like doing that. So uh, maybe I'll focus solely on that. You might yeah, want to yeah. hire a tell marketer to help you, or find a real estate agent. One in if you're in the Houston area, find a Mike Ferry trained prospector. You're going to give them the data. You're going to do the mailing. They can search for listings, but you get the you get the list maybe cold down to the good numbers, and then you can call those people yourself as an investor. Yeah, and Terry's a perfect gauge for for calling probate, in my opinion. I don't know how yeah. old you look like for 18, Terry. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Thank you. And you got the voice inflection. You got the age. You got the and I see a lot of people hiring people from overseas that have no local experience have no conversation experience and they're hoping to get the same ratio of return. If you would just pick up the phone and you're going to have two conversations yep. every day, if you call 75 people, yep. you're going to have 10 people to your CRM yep. over a third day period or 21 days, you're going to add 42 people out of those 42 people, 25% will convert. And if you're wholesaling, your average deal is going to be $30,000. If you're listing whatever the listing fee is, you know, it's just, it's way. Yeah. I've, I've grabbed it. Okay. I kind of lost track of time. I'm sorry. Let me wrap this up real fast. Thank, thank you so you much. Sorry, bro. Uh, Randy, thanks for jumping in and bringing your crew on. David, thank you for help. Terry and all the other people with great questions today, Bruce. Dean, thank you for participating. We really appreciate it. Again, this is Probate Mastery. We do, you can go to probatemastery.com. 
We do this call every Tuesday at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern time and everything else before or after that. Go on the website here. The, the podcasts are recorded and placed there as well as searchable, as well as other coaching products. Chad Corbett is the proprietor and the main coach. I'm Bill Gross. I'm just the substitute teacher this week. I just want to tell you guys, I really appreciate you being on today, participating. I'm a practitioner. I, before this phone call, was talking to some attorneys and families, and I'll be doing that as well this afternoon. I do this every call, this call every week to learn to be better myself and I invite you to join us. So thank you, everybody. Have a great week, and we'll talk to you next week.